pleasure to be back with you this this morning. Um, and I feel like that we're kind of old friends in a way. We have this is our second time to be here, but we met several of you uh, back in July at the Area Wide Sing in Salisaw. And uh, we have some really uh, good memories, even though this is only our second time of, of fellowshipping with you. The last time we were here, uh, the rains and the beaches, we went to the, uh, out here at this Soda Steve's Thin and Feather. We had a nice lunch. And of course, I always enjoy talking with Brother Doug and, and those type of things. And of course, uh, as I told uh, Brother Beach this morning, we really did like those lemon cucumbers. And so... <laughs> We may be back next summer just to get a load of those, okay? So, um, uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to come over here. I'm not a professional preacher. Uh, I'm just a Christian like you. I enjoy telling other people about the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And we're really excited to be a part of the World English Institute ministry. And I'll talk about that later on. Um, I would tell you, uh, I know you had, uh, you're affiliated with the uh, India Missions. Um, Terry and I, uh, we have been supporting that, uh, that ministry for, all, I, I was just trying to calculate in my head, it's at least 30 years. And so when I retired in 2015, one of my goals in retirement was, okay, I've been supporting, we have been supporting that work for, for many years, I'm going to go and I'm gonna see for myself. Um, because I read the numbers, and he, as you, many of you know, Brother Clayton, uh, he uh, died earlier this year, and so they have a new team that's forming, and they're right now not able to go to India because India canceled all the visas, so they have to, everyone has to apply. And uh, I have a visa that was, I thought was good till 25, but I learned uh, it's no longer any good. I have to apply if I wanna go. But anyway, in 2016, I went over and I spent a month in India with Brother Ron and Sister Clayton, uh, Sister Karen, and uh, it's amazing ministry. And everything you read in those uh, those mission reports, they're true, uh, from what I could see. And it is just there are more Christians in India, there are more churches of Christ in India than there are in the United States. And uh, Ron's philosophy was, you know, in case someday we can't go back to India, you know, what I'm going to do is I'm going to train them, I'm going to trust them, and then I'm going to turn them loose. And that was his philosophy, and I think it's worked out really well. Um, we went over, uh, I went over, and it's, it's a hard place to go, I will just tell you that. If you want to travel in India, you have to be ready for some hardships, and um, they don't use Western toilets like we do, and if you're, especially if you're a lady, it, it's not easy to, to, to be there. And I think a Sister Karen and how she dresses, try to be, you know, like an Indian and to fit in uh, and to take care of business and to do that, it's, it's, it's tough. And I asked Ron, I said, uh, what's been the greatest change? You know, I think they've been to India in about 30 years or so. And he said, you know, we used to have to boil water for hours so that we could have fit water to drink. And now we got these things. And you don't realize how much time every day that saved us and to do other things. And then, you know, of course, cell phones and other things. And so uh, I commend you for supporting the work in India. I recommend it highly. Um, the numbers are real. The people are hungry for the gospel there. Uh, when, when you're a Hindu... Uh, and you're in that lower caste, you have, Hinduism offers no hope for you. No hope whatsoever. You're just going to die, and maybe if you've lived a good enough life, you're going to come back as either a dog or a, or a human or a cow or something like that. And it offers no hope for salvation. And so a lot, that's why a lot of the people that are converted to uh, Christianity through the India missions are poor people because they're in the lower caste and they've been shunned for their our entire life and the gospel gives them hope. So you're to be commended and I would encourage you to, to continue to support that good work. And if you have any questions about that, I can answer. Of course, you know, my information will be as of 2016, so it's gonna be a little dated. 
So go ahead and turn back in your Bibles to the book of Acts, uh, chapter 20. And, and let me say again, I really do thank, uh, thank you for allowing me to be here this morning. Uh, Brother Doug read that, and I want that section, Acts chapter 20, verse, starting at verse 17 through 24. But I'm just going to go back and talk about, uh, you know, he's telling the, the Ephesian elders, you know, things are going to get rough. Every place I go, the Holy Spirit says there's chains and tribulations. And then beginning at verse 24, he says, none of these things move me. He says, you know, I'm not afraid. I'm not going to change what I was put here on earth to do. Nor do I count my life dear to myself. You know, I'm, he's saying, you know, my life is in the hands of God. It's, to do, it's in the hands of Jesus. But he says, I do not do, nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the grace, to the gospel of the grace of God. And so that last phrase, testifying to the gospel of the grace of God. That's where we're going to put most of our focus on this morning. And of course, you all know, you've been in church, many, many, many of you for a long time, you know that gospel means good news, and you know that grace means unmerited favor. And so when you uh, put those together to testify to the gospel of the grace of God, what we're basically saying is God has provided a way of salvation and that he has done this without the Christian or the individual having to earn or merit their salvation. And so if you're a person who likes to take notes, we're going we're gonna to have three columns in your notes today or three headings. We're going to talk about the need for this grace of God. We're going to talk about the provision of this grace. And then we're going to talk about the reception of this grace. And then I'll talk a little bit about World English Institute, and then we will, the lesson will be yours. So in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, a verse we're familiar with, it says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We need this grace that, that was Paul's ministry. And then in James chapter 2, verse 10, it says, For whoever shall keep the whole law yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. And let's change, turn down our Bibles to Romans chapter 6, verse 23. It's a familiar verse, you know it, but let's read it to begin to again. It says in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. So we're talking about the need of this grace. We've talked about that uh, we all have sinned, that we all have broken the law, and that the wages of this sin is death. Now I'm going to take a little side trip here. This is, and we'll come back to my lessons. But you know, we often quote that verse: "For the wages of sin is death." But but we forget that next little thing, that next little phrase. So it says, "Comma, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord." Amen. That's good news, and you know. I, I don't know about you, but I like to look at stars. I, I like where we live. I can look up and I can see the stars. And over the times, I've, in my time in the Navy and in the time since then, I've learned what the constellations are and what stars are there. And as I look up uh, in the heavens, uh, it's just, it's just ama it's an amazing sight. I think we live in a part of the country where we don't have as much light pollution as, say, oh, the Dallas-Fort Worth area, the, the East Coast. But... You know, I, I used to think that I'd look up there and, and think, I'm so small in this wide, vast universe that here is this, this divine being who said, let there be light, and he created the heavens and the earth. And he created the, the Vega and Deneb and Altar, which is part of the, the summer triangle that we see in the summer. And I think, wow, I... The, the being who created me 
He wants to give me the gift of eternal life. And you know, that's just an amazing thought. I could end my lesson right here, and I think we'd all be edified and encouraged with that because we should be. But then I, someone pointed out, I read something, and it's, it's not about me how small I may feel, even though that's true. It's really about how big God is. It's God who is this big, vast uh, being who somehow in his grace and mercy, he loves the little human beings that are just scrambling around like ants on this, on this earth. And, and I just think it's an amazing thing, but I also think it's a lesson for another day, Doug. So uh, we'll have to move on. But in Isaiah chapter 59, it says, Your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, and he will not hear. And then again in Isaiah 64, verses 6 through 7, it says, But we are all like unclean things. All of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And so this is not a pretty picture of the human condition is it just think about it we've all sinned if we break one law we've broken them all yeah, the wages of sin the we see you know we see we have this term the minimum wage in our country i think it's seven dollars and some odd it's what do you the minimum you have to pay well what we have to pay for our sins is death and our this sins they separate us from god and we are unclean so that our uh, righteousnesses are like filthy rags. I mean, that's a pretty pathetic condition. Um, Paul will say in Romans chapter seven, you know, towards the end, you know, he'll rhetorically ask this question, oh, what a wretched man I am. Who is going to save me from all this? I'm paraphrasing a little bit there. And of course, we know that it's, he answers his question in the next sentence thanks be to god to jesus christ Amen. and so what these verses mean to us first we must all have to plead guilty every accountable person has sinned and we cannot demand entrance into heaven based upon our own merit based upon anything that we have done because even the best of our abilities are as filthy rags in the sight of god and so when our sins alienate us from God, our relationship is broken with him. You know, whenever in the garden, Adam and Eve had a close relationship with God. But when they sinned, everything changed. And that relationship would, could never be the same again because God is a pure and holy and righteous uh, judge. And so in, let's open our Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. And let's look at uh, verse 12. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 12. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And so this is actually a quote from Psalms uh, 34 that Peter writes there. And so to think about that, do you really want the face of the Lord to be against you if you do evil? And so we can't run away from this guilt. We cannot work our way out of this guilt. So clearly we have identified there is a need for this grace of God. And so let's talk about this word sin for a moment. You know, we kind of assume things. We, everyone knows what sin is. But, you know, it's, it's translated to mean it's an archery term, if I understand it correctly. When you take a bow and arrow and you shoot at a target and you miss the bullseye, the idea is that a person would sin. And so it's about missing the mark. And so in English, that's how it's been translated for us. And so think about it. God is holy. And so when we do or say or think unholy things, we miss the mark. And God is faithful. And if we are unfaithful, we sin because we've missed the mark. 
And God is loving and kind and gentle. And when we say and do things that are not kind, that are unkind, that they're coarse, they're harsh, we miss the mark. And so we sin. And God is righteous. And if we think and do and say things which are unrighteous, we miss the mark. And so we sin. And God is pure. When I have an impure thought, when I watch impure things, when I read impure things, I miss the mark. Because that's the standard that God has set. And so we echo what Paul said earlier, who will save us from this wretched condition. And so now under the P, the provision of grace, let's see what God has done to provide an escape from this faith that we've talked about. Well, first of all, out of love, he provides his son, Jesus, for us. And we're familiar with John 3, 16, 1 John 4, verses, uh, verse 9. So let's turn to 1 John 4. 1 John chapter 4. And let's read verses 9 and 10. 1 John chapter 4. Verses 9 and 10. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. You know, we don't use that word propitiation much in our vocabulary today, but, you know, some versions use the term an atoning sacrifice. The idea is of one of substitution, that God has made Jesus, his son, the substitution for us. Yes, we deserve death. Yes, we deserve punishment, but God has substituted Jesus. He punishes him. He puts the sins on him and he is, Jesus assumes the obligation of our sins. And so God offers that as a sacrifice. He sees that sacrifice. He accepts that sacrifice and he says their sins are atoned for. And he does this because he has to, because God is a just God. He cannot let sin go unpunished. But because he loves us. God's grace provides us an escape route. His justice requires the sacrifice. He, he provides it through Jesus. And then he recognizes Jesus' sacrifice on the cross as the suitable payment for the sins of men and women. And so to satisfy both his justice and his love, he gives, he provides this grace. But is this grace unconditional? No, it is not. Because otherwise everybody would be saved. There are some man-made religions who do believe because Jesus offered a sacrifice once and for all that everybody is saved. Doesn't matter what you do. Doesn't matter what you think. Doesn't matter how you act, how you treat your neighbor, what you do. It's called universalism, Christian, universe, Christian universalism, and it's a false doctrine. It's simply not true. Just think of, I don't have to know any Bible to know that if that is true, why would Paul and all the apostles go through what they did? If everyone was already saved, why would they even go down that road? They'd just say, okay, everybody's saved. Let's go and have a, you know, a nice party. Let's eat, drink, and be merry. We have no work to do. It's just a false doctrine. Every, God wants everybody to be saved, but not everybody will be saved. Only those who accept this grace of the gospel of God. And so that brings us to our third point, the reception uh, of grace. And so Jesus is the author of our eternal salvation to all who obey him. We read that in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 9. And when someone 
decides to be obedient, what will they do? Well, they'll believe that Jesus is the Christ. They'll believe that he is the son of God and they'll put their faith, their trust in him. But, you know, Jesus said a lot about repentance as well. He talked about having faith. That's true. But he also talked about repentance. And what is that repentance? Well, it's simply changing our heart and our life. And you cannot be, if you're saying, I believe and I want to be baptized, but you're not willing to re repent, then you really are, are not completing what God has asked you to do. Sometimes we're in such a hurry, we got to get someone to the baptistry because we need to have them be baptized. But if they're not willing to change their life, they're not willing to change their heart, as soon as they come up with the water, they're going to keep living like they used to live, then they may just have just got wet. And so we need to remember that repentance is changing our heart and our lives. And it's a slow process. It takes a lot of time. You look at the, the life of Jacob. The Jacob was a liar. He was a cheat. And he found out once he was, after he lied to and cheated other people, he was lied to and cheated himself. And he didn't like it. And he had favoritism in his family. He saw what it did in his his, between his mother and himself and his father. And later on, he, he did exactly the same thing. He favored uh, Benjamin, he favored Joseph, and it brought all kinds of problems to his house. But yet he is considered faithful. You look at the end of the, the book of Genesis, and there he is. He's blessing the, the, the 12 boys. He's worshiping God as he leans on his staff. And repentance and, and changing our hearts and our lives takes time. It's just like the, the Jacob in the, in the Old Testament. He wasn't always the man that God wanted him to be, but he was faithful. He's, he's mentioned in that famous Hebrews 11 uh, chapter as someone who was not perfect. None of those people were perfect, but they were faithful. And when they made a mistake, they got up and they said, God, forgive me, I'm a sinner. I want to repent. And they, tr they kept trying. And that's what God calls us to do. And then if we're willing to change our heart and life after having put our faith in Jesus, then we will be buried with Christ in baptism for the forgiveness of our sins. And you say, and that's an amazing thing that we talked about our, how that we are sinful people. But if we will obey what God tells us to do, an amazing thing happens that God will forgive us of our sins. We're united with Christ. We put on Christ. Um, you know, if I take off this coat, uh, I'm not in this coat. It's, it's if I put it here on this table, but when I put on this coat, now I have the blessings and the benefit of this coat. And it's the same thing when we put on Christ in baptism, we are united with him through his death and burial and resurrection. And now we're clothed. We put, put on Christ. And then two other, I mean, the first thing's amazing. Our sins are forgiven, but there are two other amazing things. That happen. And this first one is God gives us this gift of the Holy Spirit, this non miraculous personal indwelling that we have with of the Holy Spirit. And I don't always understand how that works. And I don't understand how it's manifested. But by faith, I believe that I that I have been given the gift of the Holy Spirit, because that's what Peter told the people would happen if they became a Christian. And if I have done the same things those people have done and they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, that's what I have, too. And that's what you have if you're a Christian. And then the third thing that happens that amazing is that God adds you to the church. He adds you to the body of Christ. Your sins are forgiven. You receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You're added to the church. And that is good news. But we never need to make sure that we understand. We need to understand one thing. Salvation always has been and it always will be by grace. It is not by works of righteousness, which we have done. It is by grace we have been saved through faith. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8. And so when a penitent sinner comes to Jesus and is baptized into him, they have their sins forgiven, they're added to the church, they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and that's the good news, that's the gospel 
of the grace of God. And we should be thanking God every day that he has given that to us, that we have had the opportunity to hear that, to believe it, and obey it, and then trust it. Now, I want to say one thing really, really quickly, and that is we cannot save ourselves. Humans do have a part. We have to obey. God is clear about that. But when you stop and think about it, it's God who does all the work. And so let's turn in our Bibles to Colossians chapter 2. Because I think there are so many people who want to accuse us of, of work salvation. And I'm, I'm going to get to that. But let's talk about uh, this. Colossians chapter 2 verses 9 through 12. Colossians 2 verses 9 through 12. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not made, made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh with the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. So God's part or his grace is far better, is far more important than my work, than I, anything I do. It is God who's doing the work. It is God who is doing the cleansing. It is God who is taking, given by, doing this by the, his own power. And so let's keep reading to verse 13 and 15 there in Colossians 2. And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, has made alive again with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of the requirement that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphant over them, triumph over them in it. And so it is God who makes it alive. It is Christ who forgives us and Jesus who cancels the debt and Jesus who disarms the powers and the principalities. It's Jesus who triumphs over sin by the cross. And any victory that we might enjoy is a direct result of the work that God and Jesus have done. And so when we talk about our, con our conversion, or we talk to anybody about receiving this gospel of the grace of God, if they're honest, they won't mistake us for thinking of and speaking of work salvation. But they will understand that it has always been by grace that we have been saved through faith. And then that faith that calls us to obey what God has told us to do. And so... We've talked about the need for this grace. We've talked about the provision of this grace. We've talked about the reception of this grace. And so you may ask yourself, well, if this is such great and wonderful news, why isn't this place packed with people? Why aren't people knocking on the door to get in? Well, it's maybe they really don't understand that the need for grace is in their lives. They think, well, I'm a good moral person. I don't cheat on my taxes. I try to obey the speed limit. You know, I give to the Boy Scouts when they come to the door. When I go to the Walmart and there's a Salvation Army, the guy, he's going to start ringing that bell. You know, they put a $5 bill in there and they think, you know, I'm a good person. But you would be surprised. I, mean, I know you wouldn't because you're Bible students. Most of the people that were converted in the book of Acts already were good, righteous people. Saul of Tarsus, he was a Jew of Jews. He thought he was misguided in what he was doing. But if you wanted to, you know, he says, as far as the law, I was faultless. Cornelius, the, when, and, um, he was a Roman centurion, but he was considered a, a devout and a godly man. But yet he was still lost. Lydia and Philippi, Paul went down to the river looking for a place to pray and he finds Lydia there 
Obviously, she was a godly woman. She wouldn't have been at the place of prayer. She accepted the word of God and became a sister in Christ. But she was still lost, no matter how good she was. And what about the Ethiopian eunuch? He had just come from the temple. He was worshiping. He was reading the Bible as he was going down the road. Uh, he was re re reading uh, Isaiah, the, the scroll that was available to him. So here's a guy, in our, let's use our language. He had just been to church. He was studying his Bible, but still he needed to hear the gospel of, of Christ, didn't he? And so, as Isaiah says, you know, all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. And you know, it may also be, so they don't understand the need, they may not be aware of the provision of grace. God wants everybody to be saved. And that's where we come in, just telling the provision. I know you're going to do some door knocking next week. There's a good way to give them that information. And it may be they don't know the right way to receive this grace. You know, if you turn on the TV this morning and someone's going to say, just say this prayer with me. And you, if you're in a bar, if you're at a sports com complex, if you're at your home, just say this prayer with me and... You know, you're going to be saved. You're going to be a Christian. And, and, and if we've talked about this morning, that's just not a biblical concept, is it? It just doesn't work that way. And so people need to listen to what Jesus taught and what the apostles taught. And nowhere will they find this, say this prayer, and you'll become a Christian. Read the book of Acts. And so I want to just end, pause right there. I want to tell you a little bit about World English Institute. Um, it began in 1989. It's a, it's a Bible study uh, alternative for people to study the Bible on the Internet. Uh, what we do is we try to get uh, people who are interested in improving their English. We're not for people who don't know any English. This is for people who've had two to three years of English. And what we do is we use the Bible to help them improve their English. You want to talk about nouns, pronouns, demonstrative pronouns, adjectives, just take us any sentence out of the Bible. We can take Acts 2.38. You can break that down. You can learn about verbs. You can learn about subjects. You can learn all about certain things. You can learn to read. You can learn to your listening comprehension. And so what we do is we take that interest, the people who want to learn English or improve English, we use the Bible as the textbook, and then we hope, as we know that as you study the Bible, yeah, they're going to get their English, but they're most of all going to get the Bible. And, you know, I tell people that we, we're an English teaching ministry, but... It's, it's really not so. We're, we're a gospel teaching ministry. We want to preach, teach the gospel. And if in the process of that, we can help you with your English, then that's what we're going to do. We're going to start the book of Genesis. We're going to go through the book of Acts. And we're going to take it and tell you about this God who created you. He has a plan for your life. And here's the plan of how you can receive salvation. This gospel of the grace of God that we've been talking about this morning. Um, English is the language of the modern world. If you want to get ahead uh, in today's business and economic climate, and you're living in a country where English is not your second language, you're at a disadvantage. It allows you to get a better job, get a promotion. It allows you to get into a better school if you're a student. All the technical journals of, of uh, medicine, of technology, uh, all computer programming is done in English. And so if you do not have the skill of, being Eng of having English and you want those things in your life, then you're going to try whatever you can. And because our lessons are free, students can get on and they can help improve their English. You know, if you're in the cockpit, I don't care where you are, if you're in Kathmandu, Nepal, and you're in the cockpit and you're approaching the tower, you're not going to be speaking Nepalese. You're going to be speaking English. In the tower, English is in the cockpit. That's the only thing that's spoken. So it's important for people who want to improve themselves. And so we use the Bible as an English text. And that's not foreign to us as Americans. 
There was a time in our country as we had the westward expansion, there were no schools. And people, families taught their children how to read by reading the Bible every night. And so it's not a far-fetched concept to use this. And so I'd like to encourage you to think about becoming a world English teacher. Let me, let me, let me allay some of you, maybe your concerns. There's no records to keep. Everything is kept on the internet. You do not need to be an expert in English because all the grammar questions are answered with true false. The computer grades those for them and it sends them back. And in addition of giving the students, if they miss the question or whether they even get it right, we're going to tell them why the, why the answer was correct. So it's going to do, you don't have to do that. Your job is to help answer the three or four thought questions that are at the end of every lesson. The first introduction lesson is over the prodigal son. And it asks two or three questions. What, why, why did the boy want to leave his home? Why was the older brother angry when he came back? And what do we learn from this about God? What does this parable teach us? The students write their answer. You, um, you help them in two ways. Did they, were they able to read the story? and comprehend it enough to tell you, it might be in broken English, but did they tell you what the story was about? Did they answer the question, why did the younger brother want to leave home? So you wanna make sure, did, you, did they get it biblically correct? And did they write it in comprehensible English? And if they didn't, just help them. Maybe they said, he did want to go and leave his family. Well, he did want is not good English, you know? He, you say he wanted to leave his family. And it's very small things like that, punctuation, spelling, uh, those type of things. And sometimes a student will write, you know, the equivalent of the New York City telephone directory there. And you'll say, wow, what do I got to do? I, I just usually pitch one or two sentences and say, I understood what you meant. Here's two sentences. I would recommend you write them this way instead of the way you did. And students appreciate teachers who are personal people who are treated don't want to be treated like numbers um, I'm learning Spanish and it's hard and we think oh English is so easy because we've grown up with it but it is hard and your students will sometimes ask you some questions oh, I had a student one day said we were talking about something completely different he says why does God hate homosexuals well, we had to stop what we were teaching there and we chased this rabbit, but we have to make sure we get back. And so they're going to ask you some questions sometimes, some of your students, and it's going to help you to become a better Bible student because until you start teaching something, you don't really know something. And so, uh, and then sometimes they just ask really, they, they'll tell you very personal things. I have a, had a, she's no longer a student, so she quit. Uh, but she lived in a Muslim country, and she was studying to become a doctor. And she uh, was diagnosed as being depressed with depression. And she said, you know, you are the only person that I can talk to about this because in my culture, women do not talk about depression. Even though I am a medical student and I know if I go and talk to my medical teachers, I'm going to be marked as somebody who's unfit to be a doctor. And so you're the only person that I can talk to. And, you'll, and they will tell you stories that just break your heart. And you'll think, okay, I'm making headway with this person. And then one day they don't, they never take another lesson. And you just, you know, your heart breaks, but then you go and you get another person to teach instead. And that's uh, what we do. We have every day on our site, there are 200 people who have completed the lesson on the prodigal son and are waiting for a teacher. And so that's what we do. We, we need teachers, and so we don't want those students to wait, and so that's why we're here. I'm not here to ask for money. I don't want to be a part of your budget. I could care less about you putting support to World English. I'm here to recruit somebody, someone who will serve as an internet teacher. Now, Doug, I know when you're, you go to Weber's Falls, 
uh, next week, and you knock on the door, and if 200 people, I think you said you're going to knock on 200 doors, but let's say you mark, knock on 201 door, if 200 of those people say, I'll do one lesson with you, would you say, ah, what a failure that was. I mean, you, you'd, be, you'd be dancing in the aisles if only one person just said that, wouldn't you? So there are 200 people right now who said, I'll do one lesson, but I need a teacher. And so um, that's what we're here to do is to recruit teachers. And I know that you may be saying, you know, I don't have internet. I don't have a laptop, a computer, or a tablet. I can't do this. But I bet you, and I understand that. And uh, I'm not asking you to... to, to uh, sign up if that's that's your situation. But I bet you know somebody, a grandkid, a brother, a son, uh, a daughter, a, ne uh, a nephew, someone who's a Christian, a faithful Christian, this might be exactly what they need. You know, I, I see we have a couple of young people here. And, um, do, you, do you two girls, do you spend at least one hour on the internet a day? Would you say you do? Okay. All right, I do too. I'm not condemning you for that. But there's a lot of young people who spend, a, they, they get on there and they, they watch cat videos and older people too, I know. They watch these cat videos and these butterfly things and they, you know, they know all these things, but what if they took, if they spent five hours on the internet every day and one hour of that five hours, they spent helping somebody learn the gospel of Jesus. Wouldn't that be amazing that everyone could do that? And so if, if we're not for you, please uh, don't uh, feel obligated to, but take one of our brochures. In the back there, we have a brochure. Take one of it, it's a yellow piece of paper. We have some bookmarks I want, uh, by, behind Sister Dixon there. I want you to take uh, a, a, a a flyer. There's a bookmark there. We even have some mints in case you have bad breath. You know, get one of those. And we have, uh, there's also a little sheet back there. You may know somebody who needs to improve their English. Sometimes I'm in Walmart and I'll hear people speaking, you know, uh, in Spanish or something like that. Take one of our cards, put it in your wallet, and next time that happens, say, hey, would you like to improve your English? Here's a, where you can sign up for free to improve your English. Uh, are you interested? And they may say yes or no. They're, I don't know. We'll take it. Maybe you know it's your, your son or your daughter or your neighbor. They might do it. And so that is, uh, that's back there. So I encourage you to take that. Uh, I want to say two more things and then the lesson will be yours. Uh, you may have heard of World Bible School. Uh, we love World Bible School. We are not in competition with them. We are collaborators in every sense of the way. They help us, we help them. Uh, we have the ability to go to countries because we're English instruction. So we have a lot of Muslim students. We have a lot of uh, Hindu students. We have students from 192 countries. You can choose whichever country, whichever student, young, old, male, female. Um, uh, we have Jews, we have people who are atheists, we have people who are Hindus, Buddhists, uh, all kinds of man-made religions, and we had, last year we had 37,996 students sign up and take one, at least one lesson from 192 qu countries. Uh, we do have students from here in the U.S., Canada, Australia, the U.K. Most of those are immigrants who have come to those countries, and they, want, they know they've got to fit in, they've got to assimilate, and so unless they learn English, they're not going to do well. And so you may think, well, we probably don't have many students from Australia, but we do. Uh, English, you know, is the language there. India, four thousand. Well, I have almost 5,000 students from India. Iran, Iraq, each of those, we have about 300. Saudi Arabia, let's see, Saudi Arabia. Um, we have 57 students, you know, if you... Doug, you and I couldn't go to Saudi Arabia and preach on the corner. Well, we could, but we wouldn't last very long, right? <laughs> but here's 57 people from Saudi Arabia who said, you know, I'll take one lesson. So, you know, we're just planting seeds. 
I'd, I'd like to tell you that thousands and millions of people become Christians. Uh, it's just people are people. They're like here. They don't. But we're planting seeds. And we do have conversions. Uh, teachers get a uh, quarterly newsletter. We'll talk about all those things. If somebody wants to become a Christian, uh, we use our resources with World Bible School and other mission points to get them uh, connected with a faithful church so that they can become Christians. And we ha it happens all the time. Uh, we have every in our newsletter. We have all kinds of stories about that. So that's what World Bible World English Institute is. And so I hope you'll at least take a flyer and talk to us afterwards. And I uh, appreciate that opportunity. You know, this morning we've talked about uh, the gospel of the grace of God. We've talked about how people need it. We talk about how God has provided it. And we've talked about how a person can receive that gospel. And if you're here today and you've never become a Christian, I want you to think about what we've talked about. And uh, if today is the day you want to act upon that in faithful obedience, uh, please do that. If not, uh, I'd encourage you to talk to the elders and Brother Doug here about this gospel of the grace of God. Because it's an amazing thing and you're missing out on on such a marvelous and wonderful thing. If you're here as a, a Christian and you, you need the prayers of this body, I'm sure they'll be willing and happy to, uh, to talk with you and, uh, and encourage you and, uh, and help you in any way. So if the brother would come and lead us in our song of invitation, please stand and uh, thank you for your attention this morning.